I'm, I'm Peter Lim. I'm the founder of Trident Analytics as an independent research house. We do research on, on the global economies, the global markets and global industries. At, at the most front, we start with the chip design. So these are the companies where actually they design chips. And if you go one step even before, we talk about EDAs. EDAs are actually the tools or the software that are being used to design the chips. So in terms of EDA is actually being dominated by three players in the world, you know, people like uh, Cadence, Synopsys and even Mentor. So these are companies that actually design the tools which the chip designers use to design the chip. So when it comes to chip designers, you can basically break down into two further categories. One is actually we call them the IDMs, the Integrated Design Manufacturers. On the second, we call them Fabless. Okay, let's start with IDMs. IDM simply means these companies not only they design the chip, they also manufacture the chips themselves. So these are people like your Intel and your Samsung, right? They are integrated, they design and they manufacture. The other category we call them fabless. Actually, the words actually means fabrication-less, means no fabrication. So these companies, they are just purely design houses. And this is actually the, the big part of where the value chain is, right? Um, you talk about people like your NVIDIAs, um, people like even your AMDs, um, your ARM per se, or even your Apple. So these are the place where I only design, but I don't manufacture. So this is the chip designers. After the chip design came, we call them the foundries. So the foundries are the guys who actually convert that chip design into a physical chip. And usually it's in the form of a, of a wafer. So these are where we call it as a foundry. You see those round discs with a lot of colourful squares, those are actually the foundries. Right? The global place foundries, of course, the largest that people are TSMCs and global foundries. So these are the two big players in the foundries. I'm Samsung, not properly in Samsung. So the world is pretty much dominated by TSMC and Samsung. Right? So after foundry, the next stage, we call them the OSATs. Okay. In a very layman explanation, OSATs are the guy who actually cut out the die or the chips in the wafer, package it to make it um, that you can handle it physically into a chip. So these are what we call as OSATs. Um, we have four OSATs in Malaysia, for instance. We have our Unisam, MPI, Inari, and also Glyptonics. And three of these four OSATs are actually the top 25 in the world. So we're actually quite, quite big in the OSAT space. So what is supporting the OSAT are in the whole pro packaging of the chips, there are a lot of equipments needed, big testing machines, uh, production machine per se. So that comes to the next big category we have in Malaysia, the testing space. Right? We have a lot of companies that produces testing equipments to actually um, test, or we call them do a functional test of the chips during whole production processes. And this is quite a big category we have. I mean, we, we have very, very common, common names like your, your Penta Masters, for instance, uh, your, your LSOF, your Vitrox, uh, per se. So this is quite, quite a big segment there. Okay. Now, we talk about ancillary services. Ancillary services mean to say, we also have players who provide precision components and parts that will be supplied to these equipment players for them to build the equipment. And again, we have quite, quite a big segment here we form the, the, the either it can be precision parts or they can be involved in metal sampling parts if it's a physical part of it so that, that basically sums up the, the first part of, of of the semiconductor value chain to the next part which is the EMS now EMS is actually involved in building electronic devices I mean to say they will actually take all these chips put it into a printed circuit board or mold it into printed circuit boards then they'll actually take plastic parts, metal parts, combine all together and to produce the end user uh, product, which can be, you know, it can be your fridge, it can be your aircon, it can be your iPhones, it can be your laptops, it can be anything. So those are what we call as EMS. I think the question is, how do you understand the dynamics of what affects the, the industry, the value chain, right? It's, it comes from multiple aspects. There's really no straightforward single answer. Um, back to the earlier example I gave, right? Assuming, let's take two, two very extreme. Right? Take on one hand, um, the memory chips. On the other hand, the automotive chips, right? In, in the last one and a half years, whoever is involved in the memory chips value chain, uh, not doing so well. It's down by 30 over percent. But whereas if the players are involved in the automotive chips, they're in fact doing very well because they're still, the demand is still very, very strong. On the other aspect, if you look at what kind of products you're producing, right? Are, are the end product, is it a consumer electronic space? Uh, is it an industrial good space? Or is it a telecommunication product space? 
again, it really depends, right? Um, it could have a period where your telecommunications demand, let's say for instance, the impl implementation of 5G, right? actually drove a lot of demand for telco equipments, which then also benefited a lot of chips related to telecommunication of 5G data per se. Right. Which, on the other hand, during that period, you may have a situation where consumer electronics are not doing very well. So that's also one aspect of it. So what I'm trying to say is, the chip industry is, is very diverse, very, very diverse. So that, there won't be a situation where it's a single scenario that will actually cause a straight line impact. Along the way, there will be many, many other factors to take into consideration which can also affect the demand and supply situation of that. It's a very interesting question because there's no fixed answer to that. A lot of factors come to play, like even geographical location comes into play. Uh, if you look at Malaysia now, technically our, our players' valuation is higher than our peers. A at one time, you have our local players are even more expensive than Apple or even more expensive than Google, right? So geographical location also plays, plays, plays a role. But you look at what actually affects the valuation is not so much of whether are they in the software tech or then the hardware tech or even are they in Malaysia or where, where else, right? I think it's really more of what is the growth prospect. If, if you're looking about a growth where, if your growth is cyclical, then the question to you as investor is, will you want to pay a lot of PE for a company where the growth is cyclical? On the other hand, if you have it, I'm found it, I found this company where I'm quite sure the growth is, can grow 20-30% every year for the next three to five years. Then definitely you'll say, hey, no, I'm definitely willing to pay a higher valuation to actually benefit from this growth. So there is really no fixed rule to say that software tech must be valued at this PE, hardware tech must be valued at this PE, emulation tech must be valued at this PE per se. It really depending on what is the growth prospect that you're actually looking at. My, my approach is, number one, to really understand where the company sits in the value chain. What, which part do they actually sit? The second is what products do they actually provide and what services? Um, do they really have a strong dominant position? Are they easily replaceable? Um, is their product scalable? I mean to say, are they able to increase the demand or, or to ship worldwide more of a standard product rather than a customized product? So I, I actually take all these things into consideration you know, before we invest in choosing which company to actually put the money in.